So moving on then into our measures of dispersion, we've taken a look at a few different ways that we can measure where our data is located on the on the number line. We took a look at our measures of position as to where the whole thing is positioned with our mean and our median, and then different locations with our percentiles. Moving on, what we're going to be taking a look at is this dispersion, which is saying, okay, we have our measure of central tendency, mean or median. In this case, with respect to the mean, we're going to ask, well, how far away is our data typically falling? Right? That is, if we were to take a look at, okay, I have an average of 29.17, but I have all of these different values. On average, how far is any one of these values from the mean? Now there's a few ways to do this and you're like, well, hey, couldn't we just find out the average deviation? That is the average, so deviation would be the distance from say this observation 24 from the mean, right? That'd be our deviation. Couldn't we figure out this average deviation by just going, okay, let's take the summation of each of our observations from our mean. Let's use our sample mean in this discussion. And then, hey, we want to know what our average deviation is. So we have six observations. Let's just divide by six, right? seems to make sense. We're like, okay, deviation one is going to be, uh, what's that? That's going to be 7.83. Next one there, that's going to be what, roughly 5.17. We would add all of these up, add all of them up, and then divide by six. Well, okay, this doesn't quite work. And the reason why this doesn't quite work is going back to one of our principles of the arithmetic mean, which is saying, hey, if we take the sum of all of our deviations of mean, this numerator here, this numerator is going to equal zero, meaning that zero over six would just be zero. And no matter how we try to dice this up, we would always get the same result, is that the sum of our deviations from the mean is equal to zero. So to find our average deviation, how far each of these points are on average from the mean, becomes a little problematic. So what do we do? Well, what we do in order to overcome that is we use little tricks. And the first little trick, and again, this one here is going to be our mean absolute deviation, our mean absolute deviation is just going to say, well, okay, we know that the sum of all of our deviations from the mean is going to be equal to zero. But what if I go like this instead? What if I take the sum of the absolute value of all of my deviations from mean? Right, if I take the absolute value here and then divide by n, well, I'm not having negative values canceling out my positive values. And in this case here, I'm just going to get a true kind of idea as to, okay, on average, how far am I deviating from the mean? And we can work this out, right? Let's, uh, let's draw this down. Here's our x value. We have 37, 24, 22, 28, 42, and finally another 22. If we want to take a look at the absolute value of x minus x bar. Okay, some of you might not be familiar with this, or it might have been a while since you've seen it. These little vertical parentheses almost, these mean the absolute value. And what the absolute value is, is just we're ignoring the sign. Whether it's positive or negative as our answer, we are just reporting the positive value. So, okay, we're going to take each of these x observations and subtract it from the mean. So let's go do that. 37 minus, uh, 37 minus 29.17, that's going to give us our 7.83. 24 minus 29.17, that's going to give us negative 5.17, but hey, we have this absolute value, so we're just going to record 5.17. Carrying on, 22 minus our 29.17, that's going to be negative 7.17, but again, negative, we're not interested in the negative, so just 7.17. 28 minus, well again, negative 1.17, but we'll just report the 1.17. 42 minus 29.17, that's going to be 12.83, that's our largest deviation from that mean by far. 
And then 22 again, hey, I know what that one is already, 7.17. 7. Okay, so we've done each of our values of x minus x bar, right? That's what each of these guys here are. Now we want to take the summation of that. So summation of x minus x bar, we're going to have uh, 7.83 plus 5.17 plus 7.17 plus 1.17, carrying on plus 12.83, and that final 7.17, we're going to get a summation of 41.34, assuming I didn't mess anything up there. In that sense there, carrying on, what we're going to have is, if we take this bit here, this is my numerator. So I'm going to have my mean absolute deviation to be 41.34 over 6. So working this guy out, I'm going to get 6.89. And then if we keep in mind our years in this case, so age was in years, so x is in years, x minus x bar, all in years, n, number of observations is unitless. So we really had 41.34 years divided by 6, meaning that our mean absolute deviation is 6.89 years. How do we interpret this? How do we interpret this? Well, what this is saying is that on average, any one observation is going to be about 6.89 years away from our mean. That is the typical kind of deviation that we would expect from any observation from this sample. We know, right, some are farther, some are closer, but on average, any one observation could be expected to be 6.89 years away from our mean. So that's the idea between our mean absolute deviation. Um, it's not going to be one that we use a lot. It's one that we use to introduce it because it's, well, mathematically quite easy to process, and it's easy to kind of visualize that, hey, we're just taking our average deviation. Here's all of our deviations. We had six of them, so we're figuring out that average deviation. So it's pretty straightforward in what we're calculating. Other than that, absolute values, uh, they're, they can be difficult to utilize. They can be uh, problematic in some scenarios. So what we're going to be looking at going forward is another way of essentially trying to calculate the same thing. And that there is going to be our standard deviation and in order to calculate our standard deviation we would still we would have to first rather calculate our variance and so let's take a look at these guys here let's take a look at how we would measure them starting off with the variance we have the variance so little this is the greek letter sigma so right you're like wait but wasn't that sigma that's the capital letter sigma. This is the lowercase sigma. Capital sigma is our summation notation. This guy here, sigma squared, is what we're going to use to denote variance. So what we have is we have the variance of our x variable. That variance of our x variable is going to be equal to the summation of our x minus mu square. So instead of taking the absolute value of our deviations from mean, we're going to take the squared deviations from mean, right? Keep in mind when you square a value, you just get a positive. So it's kind of overcoming that same problem we had with sum of deviations from mean equals zero. We overcome that problem by squaring our results. And then we're going to take all this and we're going to divide it by n. And okay, keep in mind here, hopefully you caught this. Greek letter, Greek letter, capital N. This is our population variance, right? So that's our population variance. This is what we would use if we have a population. Problem with this, and we'll see this when we work through it, problem with variance works out to be our units that we deal with. Because we're squaring everything, we end up dealing with squared units, which doesn't always necessarily make sense. 
So what we do is we move from our variance to our standard deviation, which is just sigma x, right? Variance sigma squared, standard deviation, sigma. Ah, uh, that there can be a little bit misleading. That's not the population variance. This is our population variance. Standard deviation of x is just going to be the square root of our variance. So whatever we calculate it up here, we get that value, we take the square root of it, and we get our standard, again, this would be population standard deviation. So that's our distinction to be had there. We'd also have, right, you're like, oh, but what about when we have samples, right? We had mu, we had x bar. So yeah, same idea here. Let's take a look at what we do for our sample variance and our sample standard deviation. So again, we're using our standard alphabet. We would have S squared of X is gonna be our sample variance. And this guy is gonna be the summation of our X, each X observation minus X bar squared all over n minus 1, right? So here's the big distinction. Here we're using all of our observations. Over here we're using n minus 1 observations. That is, if you have a sample, that is the question is explicitly saying, consider this sample of ages, but you treat it as a population, you will get different answers depending on which formula you use. So you really have to be careful with the question now based off of, okay, do you have a population data set or do you have a sample data set? And there will always be wording in the question to kind of set you along one track or the other. Why? Why n minus one? We'll come back to that. Um, we're not gonna get into the full reasoning behind it, but we'll take a look at a little example that kind of shows where this n minus one comes from. Similarly though, right, this is gonna be our sample variance, we have the same issue. This is going to be in terms of squared units. So we'd want our sample standard deviation, which is just going to be S of X. And in that case there, our standard deviation, our sample standard deviation is again, just going to be the square root of our sample variance. So Sample standard deviation, square root of sample variance. Same idea, just a little bit of a different formula in order to find the, in order to find the variance. Standard deviation, sample. That's our big part there. So distinction between the two. Let's, uh, let's take a look at how we calculate this. Uh, other than this denominator of n or n minus one, it's exactly the same process. The big work is in the numerator in calculating this bit here, the x minus mu or the x minus x bar. But same process in either case, we wanna know, okay, what is our deviations from mean squared? So let's, let's take a look. So we have our data set again that we're dealing with here. We have all of our ages. What we need to do is we need to pull out, okay, from all this, we have a value of, no, oh, wrong tool. We have a value of X bar. Let's deal with it as a sample because, well, as a sample, it's just easier to kind of view. Likely only six ages. This is a sample. It'd be a pretty small population in that case. We had a mean of 29.17 is what we had calculated in the past. So from here, we want to invoke, if we want to find the dispersion of this data set, we want to invoke our formula, which is going to be the sample variance of X, right? Because we have the sample mean, we're going to want to use the sample variance. And that's going to be our summation of XI minus X bar squared all over N minus one. So what do we want to do? First thing we want to do is we want to figure out what these deviations are. So we have our values of X, let's write them down. I mean, we could have just gone off that, but I'm running out of room. So let's write it down, down here. We have 37, 24, 22, 28, 42, and finally 
22. Now, okay, we have our mean. We've already calculated that in the previous section as 29.17. Again, if you forgot where we got that from, x bar is the summation of all of these x values over n. So we would just take the summation of all of that and we would have 29. This would all sum to 175. We would then go 175 divided by 6, which gave us 29.16666667 or 29.17 if we just rounded it to two decimal places. So again, that's how we got our mean if that bit's been forgotten over the time. Next step, right here, our numerator, x minus x bar. So let's work this out. What is the value of x minus x bar? So we're going to work out 37 minus 29.17. And right, we kind of did all of these already when we did our mean absolute deviation. So we can do this quite fast. Our 24 minus 29.17 is going to be, this time we want the negative, 5.17. 22 minus 29.17 is going to be negative 7.17. Negative 1.17. 42 minus 29.17, that was our 12.83. And then again, another negative 7.17. Now we can test this, make sure we did this right. If we add all of these up, we should get zero, right? And so you can test that. We can go, okay, negative 7.17. Um, plus 12.83, minus 1.17, minus 5.17, plus 7.83, and we get zero. So we get our response. We get what our principle of the mean said, which is, hey, the summation of x from the mean, all of our observations from the mean, is going to sum to zero. So we did this right. We didn't make any mistakes in this calculation. Next thing, well, we aren't interested in our deviations from mean, we're interested in our squared deviations from mean. So, x minus x bar squared, our next column here. So, okay, what do we have? 7.83 squared, well, 7.83 squared, that's 7.83 times 7.83. That's going to be 61.3089. I'm going to carry around some extra decimal places as I go through my calculations. I'll shorten it at the end. 5.17 squared, that's going to be 26.7289. Keep in mind, right, negative times a negative gives me a positive. That's why this works. 7.17 squared is going to be 51.489. Sorry, 40, 89. 1.17 squared is going to be 1.3689. 12.83 squared, this is going to be our big guy. 164, 6089. And finally, again, 7.17 squared. I already know that one. That's the 51. Let's just throw that in. 51. 4089. Okay. This, we now have what the square deviation is. So 7.83 squared. 37 is 7.3 years away from our mean. That is our deviation from mean. Square deviation from mean. We now want to get the sum of our square deviations. So we'll add all of these guys up. And we'll have 59.4089 plus 164.6089. So we get a sum of squared deviations to be 356.8334. So this guy here, this is our numerator. We then want to work out what our variance is all together. Keep in mind, right? This is years, years, this guy here, 
years squared, right? Because we're squaring our number of years. So we have square years going on now. So I would have my sample variance to be 356.8334 years squared all over n minus 1. So that's going to be all over 5. So divide by 5, and we have our sample variance to be 71.36668. So I'm going to go uh, 37. Ah, actually, I want to go one more step. So let's go 3668 years squared. Okay. So we have the variance of our data set to be 71.3668 years squared. What exactly does this mean? What exactly does it tell us? Well, not a whole lot, right? If we're trying to think about things and we're trying to think about it in years squared when all of our data is in years, it's rather problematic. The variance comes in useful in a few other processes as we carry on through the course, but the variance on itself is rather hard to discern what exactly it means. Really, the big takeaway is that the bigger the variance is, the more dispersion we have. The smaller the variance is, the less dispersion we have. But in order to really interpret it, what we want to do is we want to jump to our standard deviation. So our standard deviation, keep in mind this is going to be the square root of our variance. So square root of 71.3668 years squared. So that's going to give us, in this case here, 8.44788. So let's go 8.45. We're at our last step here, so let's do our rounding. And we have 8.45 as our standard deviation. Meaning, okay, typically speaking, we have an average age of 29.17. Any of these ages, if we were to pick at random, we would expect it to be, well, typically 8.45 years away from this value. So our standard deviation, this is the primary way that we're going to be measuring dispersion as we move through the course. And it gives us an idea as to how far our typical data point falls from the mean. That's the way that we can interpret that. What we can do next is we can work through very similarly same kind of result, just a compare and contrast. We can work that out for the, uh, let's change colors. We're doing a different thing here. We can work it out for our population variance. That is, let's suppose, right? And again, this is just assumption. This would be in the question. It would say, consider the sample of ages or consider the population of ages. We started off by assuming this was just a question to be considered the sample, but suppose instead it said consider the small population of ages. Well, if it was considering the population of ages, we would have gone this way instead. X minus mu squared all over n. So big things to keep in mind. Our mean, our mean would stay the same, right? Our mean. Still 29.17. The only difference in calculating our mean is notational. So that would still be 29.17. All of our x's are the same, meaning that our numerator would still work out to be 356.8334. The only difference is we would be dividing by n instead of n minus 1. So we'd be dividing by 6, giving us 59. 0.4722. Again, years squared. Just like with our above example, this doesn't really mean too much to us. We would want to change it to our standard deviation, and that's going to be the square root of our variance. So the square root of 59.4722 is going to be. 7.71 years, 
meaning that if this was actually a population data set, we would have this variance, or sorry, this standard deviation, versus if it was a sample, we would be expecting this variation. And you're looking at this and you're like, wow, that's, that's quite a bit of a difference. That's almost a full year difference in dispersion based off of just whether it came from a sample or whether it came from a population. Why? Why is that? Well, the big thing is that if this is a sample, the big thing to keep in mind is that these sample statistics, they are determinant on the sample we pull. And they're going to be different every time we pull a different sample. Just imagine, right, we have a class of about 30 students. Imagine I were to pull six students' ages and report them. Every time I'd randomly pull a new six students, I'd get a new six numbers, and I'd get a different average. They might be similar each time, but every time it would be slightly different. Compare and contrast that. Say I took a population average. That is, I took every student in the classroom and took their age and then worked out what their average age was. Well, I'd get some number. Every time I went and I took every student's age and calculated the average, I'd get the same number. So in this case here, we'd have a sample statistic. It changes every time we resample. With our population, we'd have a population parameter. These parameters would be assumed constant. They would not change. So, okay, that's the first thing, meaning that this value of mu, this is known, right? This is known from the population. It is unchanging. This case here, this value of x bar, this is not known. This has to be estimated from our sample. And the problem with that is that by using this to estimate, we then use this estimate right there to get that estimate. So because we're using an estimate to get an estimate, well, we're introducing a whole bunch of fuzz. We're introducing some uncertainty in that. To capture all that, we get a wider dispersion. We get more uncertainty in where these data points are. Another way to kind of think about how that works out, let's say we had a very, very small sample. So let's say we had, let's again change colors. Let's say we had a small sample of just three observations. So here's my X, let's say I had five, I had four, and then I had some value of X3, right? I don't know what this value of X3 is. But let's say that I did know that my mean Let's say that I knew that my mean was seven. Okay, if I knew this was the case, could I determine this value? Yeah, yeah, I could, right? Keep in mind, x bar is just gonna be the summation of these three values divided by my sample size. So that would have been five plus four plus x3 all over Sample size, three. So, okay, update this a little bit. X bar, well, I know that to be seven. And that's going to be five plus four. That's nine plus X three all over three. Let's do some algebraic voodoo. Three times seven. That's going to be 21 equals nine plus X three get x3 by itself, so we subtract 9 from both sides, and that's going to give me what? That's going to be 12 equals x3. So that is, I know now that I have the values of 5, 4, and 12. Let's check that. 5 plus 4 plus, oh, that's not a 12. 5 plus 4 plus 12 all over 3, and we get... Seven. So, okay, we did our math right, right? We don't have any mistakes going on there. What's, what's the big takeaway? Well, the big takeaway is that as soon as we estimate this value of x bar, we have essentially fixed one of these values of x. It no longer is free to move. It's no longer free to vary. One of these observations is now some fixed number, such that x bar works out to be seven. So, that is, if we go up here, because we use this estimate, 
We've lost, we would say we've lost a degree of freedom. One of these observation points is now fixed. And so as a result, we account for that by saying we actually now only have n minus 1 degrees of freedom. We only have n minus 1 observations that are truthfully free to vary because this one has caused one to be lost. That's the idea behind it, right? Being that this is a business statistics course, the real outcome is can you use the right formula in the right place? Can you calculate the right number? That's just a bit of background for those who may want to go on farther in this and are wondering why that's the case. So our primary measures of dispersion, variance, and standard deviation. In the next bit, we're going to take a look at how exactly we use these and some neat little things we can take away from them. Here, our first application that we can look at with our standard deviation is skewness. And one thing to kind of keep in mind with this is if you actually search up skewness, there's lots of different measures out there as to how to calculate skewness and of varying levels of difficulty. For our course, the level of skewness that we are using, or the measurement of skewness we are using, is determined by this formula, and it will give us a result that is bounded between negative and positive 3. Negative 3 being extreme negative skewness, positive 3 being extreme positive skewness, 0 being a symmetric distribution. You may notice in the OpenStax textbook, it does utilize a different formula of skewness. Again, as I was saying, there are many different formulas out there for our quizzes, for everything attached to our course. This will be the metric of skewness we are utilizing. So what exactly is skewness? Let's, let's visualize this. Let's take a look at just some distribution, not necessarily our ages up here, but just some distribution that I'm just going to draw. In this case, let's say that our distribution looks like this. So, okay, we have a tail that kind of carries off to the left, and then we have our big hump, and then it stops right there. So if we kind of go back to think about our measures of position, our mean, median, and mode, well, we could say, right, we can start identifying points here. We could say, yeah, okay, I'm going to have a mode right about there. Maybe it's a bit more to the right, just kind of freehanding that. That there would be likely about where my mode is. That is my most frequent observation, my most, most frequent value of x right about there. Where would be my median, right, such that, okay, we didn't really draw the axes, but technically here, our height, this would be kind of like our histogram, my height, this would be my frequency of x, how often each one occurs. So where would be my median, such that 50% falls below it, 50% falls above it, second quartile, 50th percentile, right, all synonyms in this case. Well, if I were to look at this, a whole bunch of observations fall here. That's why it's really tall. Low frequency down here. That's why it's really short. I'd, I don't know. I'd put my median maybe somewhere around there. Again, I'm just entirely eyeballing this. So there would be about my median. Finally, finally about my mean. Where would I expect my average to be? Well, keeping in mind our whole idea that the average is a balancing point of all of this data, right? Imagine it as a big teeter-totter. Well, even though we have a lot of weight over on this side here, a little bit of weight really far away from the fulcrum is going to offset more weight over there. So as a result, our mean was sensitive to these large values. That is, the fact that we have anything over here at all is going to pull my average to the left, pull my mean to the left, and I would have a mean that I would put something like that. So the big thing here is that I find that my mean is to the left of my median, and this distribution that is going off to the left, well, the distribution is going, the tail is going off to the left, I would say that this is skewed to the left. Okay. Attached to that, if we think about a number line, as we go to the left, eventually we hit zero, and then past zero, we hit negative, and then we go all the way to negative infinity, right? So to the left is all the way to negative infinity, 
to the right is all the way to positive infinity. So that is, we could also say, rather than skew to the left, we could say that this distribution was negatively skewed. So two different ways to say the same thing, to say that the tail of this distribution is heading off to the left. We could have the opposite case happening here as well. We could have a distribution. So again, let's go like this. X, and in this case, we jump up and then we're dragging off long tail off to the right there. Well, okay, we can very similarly identify our mode, median, and mean. Let's just focus with the median and mean in this case. Again, median, uh, maybe something like that, right? Big bulk here, that's going to be a lot of observations. All of these accounting for the other 50%. Our mean, average, well, it's going to be influenced by these extreme values over here. So that's going to pull it this way. All right, again, this is going to be my mean, my average. This was my median. And in this case, well, this was a negative skew or skew to the left. In our case, we see, hey, our tail of the distribution is going off to the right. So in this case, we would be skewed to the right, or we would have a positive skew in this case. A positive skew. Final case, final case, as you can imagine. And let's see how well I can draw this. It's always fun doing this one. Final case would be a symmetric distribution. So there's our value of x. And it would be, oh, that's not bad. And in this case here, if we did our median, well, median would be right in the middle. We got 50% on each side. And then if we did our mean, our mean would fall right on top. That is, with a symmetric distribution, we have our mean equal to our median. So three different possible situations, tail to the left, skewed to the left, tail to the right, skewed to the right. Equal tails on both sides, yeah, again, I'm freehanding it, but not bad. Equal tails to both sides, we'd have a symmetric distribution. Let's write that down. Symmetric distribution and the mean is equal to the median. Okay, so we can very easily visualize the skewness of a distribution. We are also often interested in measuring the skewness of a distribution. And so this formula here gives us a measurement of it. It will give us a value that's bounded between negative 3 and positive 3. So if ever you do this and you get some value of negative 8, you've messed up. You have an incorrect value in there somewhere. You will always get a value bounded between negative and positive 3. Negative 3, positive 3s are extreme negative, extreme positive skew. And 0, or the closer you get to 0, is increasingly symmetric. So let's take a look for our ages. How are the ages distributed in this case? And so if we take a look at this, let's work through it. Our skew is going to be 3 times... 29.17 minus our median, 26, all over 8.45, right? So right away, we can take a look at this and we can say, hey, look, the mean is to the right of the median, mean to the right of the median. We should be expecting that we're going to get a positive skew. Working it out, though. Well, we have 29.17 minus 26 times that guy by 3 and then divide by our standard deviation of 8.45 and we're going to get a skew of 1.125. So let's just go to two decimal places, 1.13. So, okay, we have a moderate skew in this case. 3 would be a complete huge positive skew. 
In this case here, we would expect, if this is perfectly symmetric, we would expect something a little bit more like this. such that our hump is brought a little bit to the left, which has brought the mean to the left. This is probably a little bit too extreme. It's probably even closer than that. We could try that again. Probably gonna be something more like this. And there, that might be a little bit better. Again, I'm just trying to freehand this. It's a little bit difficult, but this here, it would be pulling these extreme values here. There we go, maybe that's a little bit better. These extreme values would be pulling our mean to the right, giving us a positive skew as this tail goes off to the right-hand side a lot farther than our main body. Pretty garbage example. Freehanding that was pretty tough, but hopefully you get the idea that slight positive skew, our tail would be extending to the right. So skewness, one of our ways that we can use this standard deviation to get a measure. Next, we can also figure out well, what the likely proportion is within a certain area. And let's take a look at that. So what we're going to take a look at is what is known as Chebyshev's theorem. And what Chebyshev's theorem is, is really getting back at percentiles. And what Chebyshev's theorem is, is it holds for any unknown distribution. And so imagine, right, we have some distribution of x here. Maybe it's ages, maybe it's not. And let's suppose that it's something like this here. Right, so a eh, little bit of an ugly distribution, has this other little hump here. Not necessarily a well-behaved distribution. It's not terribly behaved, but not the best either. Let's suppose that we could work out though, right? This guy here, this wouldn't be too far different, right? We saw this was skewed to the right. And we could still work out mean, median, mode, standard deviation, and all of that. So let's say we could work out for this guy that it has a mean. All right, there's our mean. And let's suppose that that there was a mean of, I don't know, let's say 35. Further, we then work out a standard deviation and we get that the standard deviation of X, let's say, eh, just for simplicity, let's say that that's a standard deviation of five. Such that, right, we could then work through, we could then go and say, okay, maybe that's plus one standard deviation, plus two standard deviations, plus three standard deviations. And then same thing going backwards, minus one, minus two, minus three, right? Something like that. So minus one standard deviation. I can do better than that. Minus one standard deviation. Sorry, oh my goodness. Plus one standard deviation, plus two standard deviation, plus three standard deviation, and then again, minus one, minus two, and minus three. Standard deviation, standard deviation, standard deviation. So, okay, 35 plus one standard deviation, that'd give me 40, plus two, 45, and then 50, right? Each standard deviation is five, so 35, 40, 45, 50. Going back, same idea, 30, 25, and 20. We have all of these different standard deviations going through. So, okay, we kind of have this breaking up of our distribution by number of standard deviations. I've only gone to three. We could go farther if we wanted, but three will suffice. Let's suppose that I was interested in, hey, how many observations are going to be, let's go like this, here's minus two standard deviations and plus two standard deviations. Say I was interested to know what proportion of my total observations fell between those two points. So my little shaded area here. Would I expect 80% to fall within here? 90%, 
would I expect 5%? What would be my percentage of observations that I would expect to fall between 25 and 45? Well, it seems like, I, I don't know, you just made up a bunch of numbers, Keith. How, how could we work this out? Well, Chebyshev's theorem, for some distribution that we can work out the mean, that we can work out the standard deviation, Chebyshev's will tell us the minimum proportion of observations that will for sure fall within so many standard deviations. And in this case here, we would say the proportion, the minimum proportion of observations that will fall within k standard deviations. So in this case here, I'm interested in the minimum proportion that will fall within two standard deviations. So k would be two in my case, right? And as I work through Chebyshev's theorem, it'll tell me the minimum amount that would fall within this yellow shaded area. So, okay, a lot of buildup. You're just itching on the edge of your seat. What is Chebyshev's theorem? How do I solve this? Uh, it's actually quite simple. Chebyshev's theorem is one minus one over k squared. This value this value will work out the minimum proportion that will fall between those two yellow lines. So let's work that out. What do I have? One minus one over two squared. Well, two squared is four. So one minus one fourth, that is one minus 0 0.25, right? One fourth is 0.25. So 1 minus 0.25 gives me 0 0.75. That is, Chebyshev's theorem is going to tell me that for some unknown distribution like what we have here, I can be guaranteed that at least, maybe more, but at least 75% of my observations will fall between these two points, between plus or minus two standard deviations, or between a value of 25 and 45. Keep in mind, Chebyshev's theorem, it's a weaker theorem. It's not saying the, the amount of observations. It's saying the minimum amount of observations. Depending on my distribution, it might actually be that 100% fall within plus or minus two standard deviations. All Chebyshev's theorem is saying is the minimum proportion. There may always be more. So that's, that's the one thing to keep in mind. We could use this, right? We could say, alternatively, uh, let's say that we have, let's take a look at Chebyshev's theorem as an example, just because a lot of times we have trouble with this. So let's say we have a completely unknown distribution. There's x, and I'm not even going to draw the distribution. It's entirely unknown. All that I know is that I have a mean of 50, right? So there we go, that's my value, that's my population mean of 50. And I know that I have a standard deviation of 10. Okay, maybe this is, yeah, let's give it some context. Maybe this is annual income, annual income in, thousands of dollars right so that 50 that's actually 50,000 and I have a standard deviation of 10,000 okay and then given this okay I know that on average people earn 50,000 a year and there's a standard deviation of our annual incomes of 10 grand I want to know what is the minimum proportion what is the minimum proportion of people that earn between, wow, my writing's terrible with this. It's not that much worse than normal. What is the minimum proportion of people that earn between 38, there we go, that'll work, between 38,000 and 62,000? That will be much better. What's the minimum proportion that will fall in that band? Well, okay, you're looking at this and you're like, where do I start? Like, what? Okay, let's, let's throw our numbers up there. So 38. 
Well, okay, 38, that's going to be, what, maybe something like that? 62. Well, okay, that's going to be maybe something like this. And then let's think about it in terms of, because Chebyshev's theorem is all about in terms of k standard deviations. So let's take a look at our standard deviation. So minus 1 standard deviation. Well, there's minus 1. That's going to be some value of 40. Minus 2 standard deviation. So that's going to be down there. That's going to be some value of 30. Going up. 1 standard deviation is going to be 60. 2 standard deviations is going to be 70. So that is what I'm really asking is instead of, hey, what's the proportion of people that earn between 38 and 62? I'm asking, hey, what's the proportion of people that earn within, what, one point something standard deviations of my mean? Right, a 40 to 60, that's one standard deviation in each way. I'm just beyond one standard deviation, but not quite two. So, okay, how do I figure out what this one point something standard deviations are? Well, okay, the way that I can work this out is I need to figure out what is my deviation from the mean. How far is 38? How far is 62? Well, hopefully we can work that out pretty easily. 62 minus 50, that's a deviation of 12. 38 minus 50, that's a deviation of negative 12. So, okay, these observations I've just listed are a deviation of 12 from my mean. But, okay, I'm not interested in just the deviation from mean. I want to know how many standard deviations from mean. So to do that, I'm going to take my deviation from mean. So that was, again, keep in mind, just my value of x minus my mean. And I want to take this deviation from mean. So that was 12. We'll go plus or minus, right? You can do this either way. Get the plus value, plus value, or the negative value. And I want to divide this by a standard deviation. So in this case here, a standard deviation is 10. So 12 divided by 10, that's going to give me 1.2. So that is what I'm really asking in this case is not, hey, what's the proportion of people that earn between $38,000 and $62,000? I'm asking what's the minimum proportion that's going to fall within 1.2 standard deviations, right? That's going to be there to there. That is 1.2 standard deviations. So, hey, using my Chebyshev's theorem, Chebyshev says, hey, we'll have some minimum proportion that falls within k standard deviations. What's my k? Well, I'm interested in how many observations at minimum will fall between 1.2. So 1 minus 1 over 1.2 squared. And what do I get? 1.2 squared is going to be 1.44. So 1 minus 1 over 1.44. What's 1 over 1.44? 0 0.6944. So 1 minus 0 0.6944. 1 minus that guy there. And I get my minimum proportion of 0 0.3055555. So let's just go 0 0.31. Keep to our standard practice so far of just keeping things to two decimal places. So that is, Chebyshev's theorem tells me that at least 31% of observations will fall between 38 and 62,000. That is, if all I know is the average income and the standard deviation of income, I can work out the minimum proportion of people that are going to earn between two values. Again, maybe it's more. Maybe it's 60% of people earn between these two values. All Chebyshev's theorem is able to tell me is the minimum proportion. And at minimum, 31% will earn within 1.2 standard deviations or between $38,000 and $62,000. Okay.
That should be Shiv's theorem. Let's move on to take a look at another theorem. It's a little bit more powerful. It's really, we're just going to be introducing it right now. We won't be looking at this again for quite a few more chapters. And the next one is known as the empirical rule. Let's take a look at that guy. Okay, so here we have our empirical rule. What the empirical rule applies to is only when we have a normal distribution. And don't get too caught up yet about what we mean by a normal distribution. We will get back to this. We have an entire chapter that is going to be devoted to this. And the normal distribution will become the bread and butter of a big part of this course in a few chapters' time. But really the big thing is, is that if, right, Chevy Chev is missing for some unknown distribution, well, here, if we have a normal distribution, we can be a little bit more precise. That is, with a normal distribution, we can say that, okay, for sure, within plus or minus one standard deviation, all right, so there we go, plus or minus one standard deviation, we're going to have 34, 34. That's going to be, we can be sure that 68% of observations are going to fall within that plus or minus one standard deviation. This is not an at least 68%. This is, a, this is a normal distribution. We know exactly 68%. So then if we jump out to two standard deviations, well, oh, wrong tool. Let's get that a nice line there. Jumping out to two standard deviations, we can be sure that 95% are gonna fall within these plus or minus two standard deviations. And then finally, within three standard deviations, it's going to be almost all of our observations. We are going to have nearly 99% of all observations within that last little bit here. And let's just draw that down. Just over 99% percent of observations will fall within plus or minus three. And right, you can see there's 0.15% in this tail, 0.15% in this tail. So, you know, really that's 99.7, right? Essentially, this is, you can imagine, virtually all observations, virtually everything, 99.7% will be within three standard deviations of a standard normal. Right now, until we get to dealing with this normal in more detail, we won't be dealing with, hey, what is in between 1.5 standard deviations? No, 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 we won't be getting into that yet. Not until we get farther into the normal and we can deal with this in more detail. For now, it's just to introduce that, hey, this normal exists, and we can have this certainty as to the percentage of observations. So that's our normal distribution. What we're gonna do next is we're gonna take a big look at a cumulative example. We're gonna work through from a data set all of the descriptive statistics we've worked out, we're gonna do some data visualization on the data set, take a look at what the distribution actually looks like with a histogram, create a frequency table, kind of take accumulation of everything we've looked at this semester so far, put it all together in one giant question and work through and kind of see how we can get a picture of what this raw data is telling us. So let's take a look at that example next.